We created this slideshow to remember the community known as the Fort, and to document the struggles and pain caused by this profoundly flawed municipal development plan. You will see pictures of the houses, many now gone, and hear stories of the neighbors as remembered by former New London Mayor Lloyd Beachy. You will hear of home improvement plans started in the euphoria of adjacent properties cleanup, dashed by the threat and sometimes the execution of eminent domain. Hopefully, by remembering these things, we can save what remains of the Fort Trumbull neighborhood and prevent future tragedies. This is Bowditch Hall. We called it Christopher Columbus Auditorium. Um, it was uh, put up as part of the Merchant Marine Officers Training Center back in World War II. It said it had 600 seats there, but we used to hold our all-hands meetings there when I was at the lab in uh, the late 70s, and uh, I think we got more than 600 people in the building. But it was a magnificent building architecturally, and uh, really was an interesting building to hold meetings in. It uh, had great acoustics and um, was... Uh, constructed in such a way you could see the whole building from the inside. The um, open framing meant you could look up and see all the carrying beams, these massive big beams carrying the load of the roof and the walls. It was, um, well, part of what I call a barracks construction that they used in World War II. A lot of the old buildings in the Sound Lab were like that, but this was of uh, so much larger uh, members and uh, larger construction features that it would surely should have been a building that should have been saved. Uh, it had long been used at the lab and uh, was at the time uh, I was there probably one of the oldest buildings. This is a building, uh, it was up on the hill, it's off the street, I guess it must have had an East Street address, and uh, it was just a small um, family house, um, not very significant, and uh, probably uh, not very accessible uh, without building a driveway back into it. It sits uh, in front of, uh, or behind I should say, the uh, Balestrini house, which we'll take a look at later. We're here at the East Street uh, houses. Uh, Suzette's house is on the left. I'm not sure who owned the one in the in the middle, but it was uh, rehabbed by Avner Gregory. Uh, and uh, the one on the right is, of course, the uh, John Bishop House, of, built about 1890. Um, it was the house of Richard Voiles, who uh, was one of the first ones to be pressured by the NLDC to sell uh, be, with the threat of eminent domain. Now, this is uh, the house that has some fame. Uh, very simply, this again is the Voiles house. And when they were tearing this down was the day that Sandy Beachy and myself sat on the doorstep right on the right-hand side of the building there uh, and uh, were carried away as part of our protest against uh, what was being done, not to the houses so much, but to the neighborhood and to the people who lived there. Uh, the reason we were concerned about this was they were tearing down houses without notifying the folks who lived in the neighborhood. And this is just up the hill from, um, from Suzette's house. And they were living in it at the time, and they never got warning that this was happening. This is the house where the Weavers lived. It's 14 East Street, and uh, it was owned by the Balestrinis. Um, the Balestrinis lived in the house next door and um, lived there for well over 20 years and uh, she finally had to be removed by her family. The Weavers were eminent domained out of their home over in East New London back in the 70s and uh, the interesting part is that the house that the Weavers lived in there was torn down and nothing was ever put in that place and similarly now their house has been torn down here in Fort Trumbull and it's a vacant lot also. Uh, Mrs. Balestrini was um, 
finally removed from her home by her family when they sold both houses to NLDC, and most of her um, belongings were just pitched out into the street uh, to be picked up later on. It was a sad day in London when Mrs. Uh, Balestrini was forced to leave her home. This is the back of Mrs. Balestrini's house. Uh, I like this shot because it shows the interesting terrain that was um, there at Fort Trumbull. These uh, large, massive outcroppings of granite are still there. Uh, the house, of course, is long gone, but um, the, the house was uh, torn down. Mrs. Balestrini was forced to leave, and uh, it's still a vacant lot. The last resident in this house was Erica Plesius, and Erica lived there with her mother for more than 25 years. And the interesting part is she had been working to uh, fix up this house. It has new siding on it. The porch had been redone. It has a nice fence around it, as you can see, and it had this beautiful side yard with the tree and, and the outcropping of granite that we saw in the earlier picture. Um, last com conversation I had with Mrs. Blyshus was her concern that they were being forced to leave and uh, she didn't want to leave and she stood there and she talked to me with tears in her eyes while she knew that she had no other choice she just couldn't fight uh, NLDC and this threat of eminent domain so she while she didn't uh, take part in the lawsuit why well, I, I know for sure that she did not want to leave her home This is really one of the most interesting buildings, I thought. This was, again, one of those buildings that was back off of East Street. It was sort of behind uh, Mrs. Blushes' house. And this would have made magnificent condominiums. There are three floors. You could have had three condominiums there. This is the highest point at Fort Trumbull. You could see from forever from up there. Um, and, of course, as you can see, it's a strong big brick construction. It was built by Nazarino Badarlucci, uh, one of the Italian builders who built almost all of the uh, buildings in the Fort Trumbull area. Uh, well, this was truly a loss, uh, both uh, to the neighborhood and economically. I think this would have been one of those buildings where you would have had three $500,000 condominiums in there. This is right on the corner of East Street, across from Fort Trumbull. Uh, this is um, a wonderful building in the sense that it's a group of buildings owned by the Derry family. Um, when we came to New London, we lived across the street. We lived at the fort in the housing on the fort. And this was the grinder shop. Uh, it was the first grinder shop we knew about in New London. And uh, they put together magnificent lunches. Uh, when you went in there on a, uh, lunchtime, well, you didn't go there at lunchtime, simply because the sound lab people were lined up out the door and waiting their turn. Uh, it's one of those neat little uh, enclaves that people talk about having in Italy, where the family has a group of houses around a, a patio sort of and uh, it still exists that way and uh, hopefully will continue to exist as a group of houses together where people can live in a, a family environment. This is an interesting building. It was right outside what was the main gate at the sound lab at the, and when we lived there why a couple bought it and uh, turned it into rental apartments. I think there were uh, uh, four rentals in there. Uh, originally built by Stefano Tenucci and Sons. And um, the interesting part about this building is the fact that it was right next to the Hispanic church. And uh, they were running out of space. And my dream was that NLDC would make a deal with them where the NLDC would sell them this building. They could uh, put a wing on the Hispanic church and turn this into their Christian ed building. Magnificent building. As you can see, it once upon a time had a major porch out on the front, uh, extended all the way up to the roof line. Uh, you can see the uh, shadow there. Uh, it was a beautiful building and well constructed of concrete block and uh, should have been retained as a part of a, the building for the uh, Hispanic church. This is Primera Iglesia Batista de New London. Uh, they um, 
were in this building, uh, which was originally the Italian Mutual Benefit Society, a similar group as uh, to the uh, Italian Dramatic Club, which still exists in, on, in the Ford area. The, uh, the church uh, was uh, threatened by eminent domain, and, uh, and I worked closely with them and with NLDC trying to come up with a solution that could help them. They ultimately were forced out uh, and uh, built a church uh, up on Redden Avenue in New London, uh, which is a, a great improvement, but uh, the problem that the church had was that all the promises that were made to them by NLDC were not kept. And so the church, while it had already paid off all of its mortgages when it bought the new, got to the new place up on Redden, why they had to uh, undertake uh, a new mortgage. And so they're working diligently at that. This is one of the most interesting buildings to me because I talked to the young family who uh, lived there for uh, almost a year after this thing started. Um, they um, had a 10-year-old son, and I'll never forget, he uh, was quite taken with the old uh, Cadillac convertible I had, and he thought that the 10, the the eight-track recorder I had in that old car was really something unique. And we had a lot of conversations about this. I remember when I voted against the MDP, I used him as my reason not to tear down these homes. These people were there. They were happy there. They enjoyed their living in the Fort Trumbull area. Uh, but they were forced out by eminent domain uh, and uh, had to leave the area. I don't recall what their name was. I'm sorry. I don't remember too much about this house or the one next to it. Uh, I understand the last people to live here were the dog drills, uh, but uh, they sold very early uh, and uh, moved out. Uh, my understanding is that uh, John W. Shelley was an Irish railroad worker who built the place, or at least was the first resident. Uh, when you get, went on down Smith Street here, while well, you came to the gate to, before you went up into uh, where the um, fish uh, the wholesale fish work is being done and where the uh, the old uh, oil storage tanks used to be. This house had been uh, vacant for some time, bef even before NLDC came in. These two houses are uh, on Chelsea Street. Um, they had been owned, uh, last owned by Malloy Perkins uh, and uh, by uh, Jake Donahue, a couple of local um, uh, landlords. And uh, they had been vacant for uh, uh, quite some time. Uh, you'll notice there's a house way back up on the hill. That was a lovely little house up there. And it had uh, obviously had been had loving care over the years. I can remember hiking up through there. They had lilacs and forsythia and all sorts of... Uh, leftovers from a garden that um, just showed you that there's somebody had lived up there who really cared. But again, it was set well back off the street and uh, uh, was why this neighborhood was so unique is it was not really a streetscape neighborhood. It was people who built houses, uh, people who lived there built houses on vacant lots and it became part of a neighborhood. This building uh, was the most recent uh, development of this was uh, Sonalis. Uh, uh, the company where my wife worked uh, took these two buildings. Uh, both of them were uh, 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 like multi-family apartment buildings. My understanding is the brick building on the left actually had a butcher shop or a grocery on the lower floors originally. They uh, Sonalis took these two buildings and then put the center portion there and made it into their offices down at the Sound Lab. Um, I always looked at this as exactly the kind of thing that could have been done at Fort Trumbull to save it and turn it into um, a really um, viable neighborhood and um, office park. But um, it seems that um, we have to tear these down and put up new in order to uh, satisfy the criteria. This building... Um, was held by Sonalis until uh, they made a deal with NLDC and uh, uh, the building was torn down and Sonalis left. Um, uh, of course, this was after the Sound Lab had gone.
This is 59 Goshen Street. It's separated from the Italian Dramatic Club by what is now a vacant lot. It used to be the side yard. It was built by the Frazinis in 1923, and the last resident was John Thomas DeSantis. What I like about this building is the polychrome brickwork and the stucco facade uh, that's on the building. This is the way the Italians built buildings, and um, as you can see, it was a family home, a large, spacious home inside, uh, and um, was structurally sound. There was no need for this building to go away. It would have been uh, one of the finest buildings in the Fort Trumbull area had it been allowed to survive. This is Goshen Street. It's the western side. Um, it's just down the street from uh, the Sonless building, which you can see that large brick structure clear in the back. Uh, the first is number 50. Uh, the last residents were Jose and Marina Gonzalez, uh, and uh, they sold very early. That house had been vacant uh, uh, almost as soon as NLDC moved in. The house next to it is one of the truly sad stories in Fort Trumbull. Albert Anton lived there with his brother Danny, uh, and they had lived there ever since World War II. Albert had come back from World War II and uh, had bought that house and to live in the rest of his life, and uh, he had taken care of it. His brother had a lot of health problems, and, uh, and uh, the family claimed that uh, his brother's death in the middle of uh, the Fort Trumbull fracas uh, was caused by uh, all the hassle that they were getting from NLDC and the powers to be to get out of their house. Albert ultimately did sell, uh, bought a condominium, I believe, out in Waterford, and uh, is doing well, but um, that's what happens when these things happen. Uh, this is... Um, Last house, number 58, uh, is uh, one of Stash Chavon's rental properties. Uh, this is the home of our city attorney's grandfather, uh, the Londrigan family. And as you can see, the Londrigan family home now is, uh, is a pile of dirt. This is uh, across the street from Albert Anton's house that we were just talking about. And uh, you'll see on the left of this building, there is the house that is owned by the Cristofaro family. Now, the Cristofaros are another one of these families that were thrown out of uh, their home, uh, in this case in the Shaw's Cove development, um, over where there's an office park now. Uh, they were thrown out of their home so that uh, they could build a seawall to protect the downtown from floods. Well, apparently the seawall never got built, and uh, that's still a vacant lot. Uh, this house here is one of Rich Byers' house. He's a young man who bought this and the one next to it to restore them as rental and income properties. He finished this one, and it's been rented for, well, through this whole process, and Rich is one of the uh, protagonists in the uh, lawsuit that went to the Supreme Court. He did a magnificent job. You go down there and you can see some of the detail even in this picture on the front porch as to uh, how much detail he went into in making this a really lovely place. Put skylights in the ceiling to bring light into the second floor. And uh, we held a, a reception up on that second floor apartment once in the dead of winter a couple of years ago with the Institute for Justice. And it was uh, it's a lovely apartment. And uh, it, he's been able to rent those off and on for the period we've been uh, under this. This is the house next door. Uh, Mr. Byer was uh, well underway in the restoration of this house. You can see that uh, he'd gotten started. The front porch detailing is started and he had put skylights in and uh, was uh, stopped dead in his tracks by NLDC with the eminent domain threat. Uh, the interesting story on this house is this is the house where the folks who had come up from the Institute for Justice and a few other local uh, folks had slept in there the night before one of these takings events uh, in fear that the NLDC was going to show up and tear this house down because they claimed they owned it at the time. Uh, the house is still there. It is still vacant. Uh, Mr. Byer, of course, can't proceed until uh, the legal entities are taken care of in trying to resolve this problem. This house is right across the street from uh, the buyer house, only it's of course gone now. And uh, the fellow who lived there was a plumber at the sound lab. I knew him well. And uh, attached to the back of the house was, uh, was a bar restaurant that uh, he rented out. And that uh, is now... Uh, 
Um, of course, it's gone, but it was one of two um, of the local watering holes in the Fort Trumbull area, and it was there until um, everything went down and, uh, and he had to relocate. And this is Smith Street. Um, this is the eastern end, or the southern end, I should say, of Smith Street. The apartment building on the left is the apartment building owned by uh, Bill Von Winkle. He also owns the next couple of buildings down. Then the building with the uh, number of peaked roofs is owned by the Goretzky family. And it's a young family that bought that to invest and to live in and uh, got caught up in asbestos suits and everything and finally uh, ha almost, I guess they did go bankrupt and they decided they were going to save their home and save the building and they did. It got it all paid off but then in eminent domain came. Well they and Bill Von Winkle decided this isn't going to happen and so uh, they're still fighting to save their home uh, and they uh, have tenants in there and they they live on the southern uh, most uh, part of the house. Um, all the way down on the corner you will see the Fort Trumbull building which uh, had great potential for economic development, which of course has been torn down now. And in the far background, you can see the beginnings of the uh, Pfizer plant, some of the uh, construction, steel construction going up. This is one of the houses down there on Smith Street, number 17. Um, Rose Farrar was the last resident there. She was born in Fort Trumbull. She was in her late 70s when she had to sell the house to NLDC. <clears throat> She lived in this house with her husband until he got too ill and was put on extended care. It's one of the John Bishop houses down there. And it was uh, one of the houses that um, is on Smith Street down towards where the Fort Trumbull building was. These houses have all been taken out now uh, just south of um, the Goretzky house. This was a house on Smith Street. I'm not sure um, who owned it or uh, a lot of details about it, but the secret on this building is that this was not a blighted building. You can see it was well taken care of. You can see that uh, it was um, had been recently uh, restored and uh, had somebody living in it. Uh, this is a, a sample of the kinds of homes that they had in the Fort Trumbull area. This was a house that was built by John Bishop and Louis Cardell, or Crandall, I believe it is. Um, the interesting thing about this house, it was most recently owned by a, the Johnson family. I had many conversations with Mr. Johnson about his agony over this process that he was going through and um, how he was going to survive and, and the things that were going on. He finally was forced out. He uh, and his wife, uh, they had a grown daughter and a grandchild who also lived with them in this house. This is right next to the Fort Trumbull building uh, and uh, was a lovely little home. As you can see, it's a duplex, so the two families could live there quite comfortably. Uh, finally, they were forced out by eminent domain, and uh, I've lost track of them since that time. This course is the Fort Trumbull building. It's right across from the marina and um, had a long history. It served as a velvet factory at one time, later on Sheffield too ran it, um, and it also made shoes. Um, it was last owned by Peter Foss and uh, was a lobster pound. Uh, we always had great hopes for this building, and in fact Mr. Foss at one time had a developer after the NLDC came in who had a $20 million project where he was going to come in, restore this building, uh, put a restaurant up on the top floor, and uh, put apartments and offices in it. Uh, but that was rejected by NLDC uh, claiming that it was not the right time to do that and so um, that building stayed vacant until NLDC finally took it and tore the building down. So now um, it's, a, it's a hole in the ground filled with water and uh, the hopes of uh, something happening on that vacant lot are uh, conjectural at least.